Hi everyone, in this video we are going to uh, give the theory of evolution a critical look. What is the theory of evolution state? Uh, there are two parts to it. Uh, chemical evolution is supposedly the process by which water and some other compounds that were there in the early earth transformed themselves into the first living cell. And then uh, that cell supposedly evolved into the various organisms that we know today, including us humans. From a faith point of view, evolution is relevant because it is used to justify atheism. It's the atheistic explanation uh, for how all the biodiversity that we know of came uh, into being. However, evolution does not disprove the existence of God. It is possible to believe in evolution theory and also in the existence of God without having a contradiction because it's possible, it's logically possible that God could have orchestrated the process of evolution in the same way that he orchestrates gravity or electromagnetism or any of the other laws and processes of nature that we know about. But then we must also note that if at all there is a God of theistic evolution, he is not the God of the Bible. Because in the Bible, God makes it very clear about how he created everything and evolution is not the way he did it. Moreover, evolution is a very slow, a painful, a cruel and a violent process. And if there is a God who used that kind of process to create us, and then such a God prescribes ethics to us, that does not make sense. That is self-contradictory. And so the God of theistic evolution is not worthy of being worshipped. What is our stance or position as we take uh, this review? Uh, we believe in the Bible. The Bible says that God created this universe, including all the plants and animals, the living things. He created them with some capacity to vary, a capacity with, which is with limits. God created everything in a pristine state, but after that there was a fall. That is, man, the crown of God's creation, fell morally when he rebelled against God. And when he fell, he incurred upon himself and the rest of creation a curse. And thus, the, uh, the biological landscape today, the earth itself, the ground itself, today is under bondage and under a curse. Then uh, the Bible also tells us that there was a worldwide flood which was survived only by one family and the animals with them uh, in a big uh, ship. All the other animals, all the other people died. Then there was a replenishing of the earth as the survivors of the flood uh, spread uh, in all directions away from the landing point of their ship. So this is the narrative of the Bible. And that's the point of view that we take as we critically examine evolution theory. Now, as we do this, uh, an obvious question that would arise in, any, uh, in, in the viewer's mind is that uh, what gives you the authority to critically examine a theory that is, seems to be scientifically established? It seems to be believed by people who are highly qualified to speak about these things. So how can we question what they have to say. Do I have a PhD in biology? No, I don't. So uh, stay tuned. We will address this point as we go along. Let's look at the various evidences that are offered for the theory of evolution. So the first evidence is for the uh, chemical evolution. That is the process of the formation of the first living cell. So uh, in this experiment, uh, there was water uh, heated and made into vapor and this was mixed with um, various gases and there was an electric spark that was provided. So this, uh, these conditions were supposed to simulate the conditions that were there in the early, early earth. Uh, that is warm oceans and lightning and various gases that were thought to have existed in the atmosphere of that time. And when this was done and mixed with uh, and cooled, uh, then it was found that various organic molecules appeared after a few days. In particular, there were some amino acids 
Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins and proteins are some of the building blocks of living things. So uh, this supposedly is proof that life arose on its own from this so-called primordial soup. So let's uh, give a closer look at this experiment. There are many features of this experiment that mitigate against the supposed proof that it gives for the formation of life. At the very start, we should note that no living cell was produced in this experiment. In fact, Miller's original samples were preserved for decades. And even after many decades, no bacteria, no viruses appeared in, in the extract, in the products of his experiment. Apart from that, there are many other things that we should note. This experiment assumes certain things about the early atmosphere. Now, were you and I there to observe what was there in the early atmosphere? No, it's just speculation. This experiment assumes that oxygen would be absent in the early atmosphere. It is like a catch-22 situation. If oxygen was there in the atmosphere, then it would destroy the complicated molecules that are the building blocks of life because oxygen is reactive. But if oxygen is not there, it would also imply that ozone is not there. And that would mean that there would be ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun towards the earth. And that would destroy the organic molecules. So either way, we have a problem, whether oxygen is there or whether it's not there. Um, we have protected conditions in the lab when this experiment is done, but those are not the conditions outdoors. The amino acids that are uh, produced are mixed with a lot of other products. In order to uh, form a cell, we need amino acids combining with each other in huge quantities. But now we have lots of other things to separate them. Another interesting feature of this experiment is that the mixture of amino acids that was produced was racemic. That means the molecules were both left-handed and right-handed. Whereas in living things, only left-handed molecules occur. And it's not at all easy to separate a mixture of left-handed and right-handed molecules. Some amino acids have reactive groups that would participate in other reactions instead of combining to form proteins. Uh, oceans are supposed to be full of water and water will cause proteins to break down. Um, in our bodies, there are special uh, uh, special facilities to prevent these kind of things from happening. This experiment also produced a lot of chain terminators. Uh, when you have amino acids, you need to have a long chain to produce a protein. If you have a chain terminator that comes too often, then the chains cannot be long. Whereas in living things, the proteins are long chains of amino acids. Actually, all that I said up till now is sort of a side, side issues. The main, the main thing here is that no information was generated in this Miller-Urey experiment. Life consists of a genetic code and the genetic code uh, contains information. Now, we know that chemical reactions do not produce information. And so this Miller-Urey experiment really is irrelevant. Um, this is an analogy that comes to mind. Um, the amino acids can be compared to letters like A, B, and C. Now, books are made of letters. You arrange many letters together and you get a book, you'll get a theory, you'll get a novel, or you'll get a subject or a topic that is explained. So now suppose you have rats running around uh, in a printing press and you know some of them step on the keyboard or you have an earthquake there or you have something falling from the ceiling. There could be certain vibrations, certain keys could get pressed Printouts could be taken and they will have letters like A, B, and C on them. And now, this explains how textbooks of quantum mechanics could have risen on their own. Now, such a statement does not make sense. In order to have a textbook, it's not enough to print lots of A's, B's, and C's. A textbook involves information. And so you need a mind, you need an intelligent mind who will decide the arrangement of those A's and B's and C's. Now I said in German, but I have shown a book in English 
The point is that information by itself is useless. Any pattern of A's, B's and C's is useless if it is not in the correct language. Now in the human genome, there, is, there are ins, the instructions that are coded and there are also mechanisms to interpret it, interpret or translate these instructions. So in order to have all these things together, this constitutes information and this requires a human mind or this it requires an intelligent mind. And so it, it seems logical that in order to explain the uh, information content of living things, it is necessary to posit the existence of a creator. Just because random events can produce a few random letters, it does not mean that these events can produce a book. But that's what the Miller-Urey experiment really claims to do. And therefore, it is uh, futile or it is irrelevant for the origin of life. Uh, this is Paul Davies, uh, a physicist, agnostic and popular writer. And uh, he says, trying to make life by mixing chemicals in a test tube is like soldering switches and wires in an attempt to produce Windows 98. It addresses the problem at the wrong conceptual level. So here he understands the problem that it's one of information. And he goes on to ask, how did molecular hardware get to write its own software? How did dumb atoms do programming? Uh, we know that they can't. Uh, you need an intelligent mind to do programming. Uh, so that's the futility of this Miller-Urey experiment. Uh, Richard Dawkins uh, writes about the origin of life. And this is, these are two paragraphs that are taken from his book called The God Delusion. Now, I have highlighted certain words in red. And when you look at all these words, you can understand the level of speculation and the level of uncertainty that is involved in the discussion of the origin of life. Now, here I would like to address the question that I raised at the start. Am I a PhD in biology to question evolution theory? No, I'm not. But you don't need to be a scientist or you don't need to be a PhD uh, to understand the level of speculation that is involved when scientists present their own theories in their own words. So we, we hear it from them. This is not me saying something. It's not I saying that uh, origin of life is all about speculation. The scientists who are supposedly doing it, they themselves are saying and telling us that this is the level of speculation that is involved. So you don't have to be a PhD to critically examine arguments. So that's what we're doing in this video. And here we see uh, a person who is supposedly a spokesman for evolution and atheism admitting that the theories about the origin of life are all speculation. Uh, and this is not the kind of scenario where we, you know, we are working on it and the gaps are going to be closed someday. No, every experiment, everything that we already know about chemistry tells us that chemical reactions do not produce information. So it's not a case of the gaps going to be closed by further discoveries. Another evidence for evolution is the similarity that is observed in living things. So in order to store and release energy, all organisms use the same molecule called adenosine triphosphate. Then um, all organisms use the same genetic procedure to make proteins from amino acids. So on the left, you have these amino acids, they combine together, they form uh, a chain and uh, many such long chains will form a uh, protein. This procedure is the same in all organisms. There is a genetic code in which you have uh, uh, different, um, uh, different codons coding for different amino acids and proteins. And this code is universal. Uh, all organisms, actually there are one or two exceptions, but otherwise all organisms have the same genetic code. And this is thought to be evidence that they have all evolved from a common ancestor. There is also a lot of genetic material that we supposedly share with other organisms. So although there is some controversy about these percentages, 
the fact is that human beings share some amount of genetic material with other organisms. So all these similarities suggest that we have a common ancestor or that evolution has taken place, or so we are told. Another example of similarity is homology. And that is a similar body plan that you can see in different organisms. Now, what is our response to this supposed evidence for evolution? Similarity is perfectly consistent with a single creator. Now, if I'm an engineer and I build many bridges and I find that one template works or one chassis works, then I would, as far as possible, use the same thing all the time. If I make many videos like this, I will get into a pattern of a certain type, certain style of presentation, a certain style of uh, uh, giving the subject matter and presenting the sequence. I will stick with that if I find it suitable. Uh, a certain artist uh, will often show a co common pattern in the different, different paintings that he makes. So just because things are similar, it doesn't mean that they have evolved. It just so that suggests that they could have been created by the same creator and not by multiple creators acting independently. This is Carolus Linnaeus, the founder of taxonomy. Now taxonomy is the subject of, the, of classifying organisms. So in taxonomy, you look into the similarities and differences and uh, Linnaeus, use the similarities that are now tutored as evidence for evolution in his scheme of classification. But he was a creationist. If, uh, if these similarities are evidence for evolution, then why was Linnaeus a creationist? Well, he believed exactly what I just said. And that is similarity points to common origin, yes, but not necessarily common evolution. These various creatures that are similar have a common origin, but that origin is in the mind of the creator. He thought of them, and since he is one, he is one creator, he made them with a similar body plan. He finds that one thing works, and it is suitable, and he likes that, and then he uses it many times, and he has variations on a theme. So homology uh, may suggest evolution to somebody who already believes in it, but to people who already believe in creation, it makes perfect sense in the light of creation as well. So it's not exclusive evidence for evolution. Now, based on the supposed similarities and differences between various animals, evolutionists uh, have constructed trees of life. And these trees try to show, uh, you know, which are the animals that are closely related to each other and which are the animals that are supposedly very far or distant uh, relatives. Now, the thing is, if you use different markers for similarity and differences, you would get different trees, which means that no single tree proves that we have a common descent. Now, given any tree, you would be able to identify close relatives that are very similar to each other and distant supposed relatives that are dissimilar to each other. But we also find distant relatives that are very similar. And this is uh, common enough for evolutionists to give it a name. So this is called convergent evolution. So if they find distant rel relatives having certain characteristics that are very similar, they will say that, oh, this is a case of convergent evolution. You know, the same thing evolved several times. And on the other hand, if they find that uh, close relatives are highly different from each other, they will say that, well, the evolution took place uh, very rapidly, so there was a rapid divergence. So what we have here is basically storytelling uh, to explain any and every observation. If you can explain any observation by telling stories or by conjuring up an explanation, that's not a real valid explanation or a valid theory about the world around us. Some of the similarities between different organisms can be expressed mathematically, and that suggests a design that suggests some deliberate action on the part of a designer. These are supposed uh, similarities between the embryos of human beings and other organisms, and they were used as evidence for evolution. Now, the the person who pioneered the study of embryos as evidence for 
uh, evolution was Ernst Haeckel. And later on, it was found that the actual figures are different from what he drew. So basically, he was exaggerating the similarities. I mean, not that the similarity between different embryos would prove anything, but he thought it did so. But the fact is, the embryos are not as similar as he made them out to be. In fact, uh, Ernst Haeckel is an example of a person who was uh, desperate to prove that evolution theory is true. And while, and while this presentation is a scientific one, uh, let's also not forget the fact that human beings have motives. Human beings are capable of bias. Human beings are capable of vested interest. And this can cloud their scientific investigation of the truth. The third evidence for evolution is the fossils. So there are fossils of different animals and they're usually found in different layers of rock or sediments in the Earth's crust. And you have these so-called primitive animals that are found in the lower layers. And then you have the so-called higher or more sophisticated animals that are found at the higher levels of the strata. And uh, for evolutionists, this seems to make sense because they feel that the, uh, the lower layers were deposited millions of years uh, before the upper layers. And so uh, you know, these lower layers are populated by animals that lived long, long ago, our so-called ancestors, the primitive animals. And then the upper layers are more recent ones. And uh, during those times, uh, evolution was taking place and you have more sophisticated animals or more developed organisms to be found there. This is true, but we also note that this kind of arrangement of fossils makes perfect sense in the light of the biblical narrative of Noah's flood. The Bible says that there was a worldwide flood. Now this flood would have involved the sudden burial of animals. And that is precisely the condition that you need for fossilization. And if animals are going to experience sudden burial because of flooding, it's obvious that animals that live on the land, animals that are more intelligent, animals that are more agile, would be able to escape to higher and higher altitudes and thus they would um, be buried last. Whereas the so-called primitive animals, the animals that live on the sea or on the seashore, the reptiles, the crawling animals, these are the ones that would find it most difficult to escape the flood waters. So they would be buried first and then the higher animals. So the same, um, uh, the same fact or the same observation in geology or paleontology which is tutored as evidence for evolution, also agrees or makes sense in the light of the biblical record. So it's not exclusive evidence for evolution. There are many features of the fossil record that seem to agree better with the biblical narrative than with evolution theory. For example, there is the, the Cambrian radiation or the Cambrian explosion, which is the sudden appearance of all the major phyla all the major categories of animals in Cambrian strata. And these animals are fully developed. They are sophisticated. They, are, they have got elaborate designs. They are fully functional. And there is hardly anything beneath them. So um, the obvious question is, wh where are the transitional forms? Or where in the fossil record do we see the gradual development of all these uh, representative members of the phyla. So the Cambrian radiation uh, is surprising from the point of view of evolution theory, but from the point of view of Noah's flood, we just understand it's the first layer of burial. Then we have fossil graveyards. Why should so many animals, huge animals, die in large numbers right next to each other? It makes sense if there was a landslide or if there was an earthquake or an upheaval as part of the flood. That is what we expect in Noah's flood. We have um, fossils of animals that lived very long ago. And these animals supposedly evolved into other animals, so they don't exist today. But sometimes you have, uh, there have been occasions where the same animal has been found. So now you have a, 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 a Celosan fish, which is, modern, which is still living today, and it seems to be very similar 
to its fossil cousin who lived three, supposedly 340 million years ago. So evolution theory basically says that in order to su survive in this struggle for survival, natural selection took place and fish became people. So they had to become people or they had to become other fish to survive. And yet there are some other fish that survived pretty well just remaining the way they are for 340 million years. Now this seems strange. Uh, this seems contrary to what the theory says. And again, it's very easy to come up with storytelling to explain these observations. But if uh, you indulge in storytelling, that's not logically sound. A polystrate fossil is a fossil that spreads across layers. Now, according to the evolutionary interpretation of sediments, these layers were deposited at different periods of time that span millions of years. But if there was this tree trunk uh, protruding out here for millions of years, it wouldn't have survived. It wouldn't have become a fossil. It would have been scavenged away. So this phenomenon or this observation of polystrate fossils fits in much better with the biblical record. That is, these layers were all quickly deposited, perhaps within a few hours or days or months, and it's feasible for a tree trunk to survive for that long. Uh, dinosaur tissue has been found that is unfossilized with blood cells in it. And uh, this is certainly unexpected uh, for animals that supposedly died off millions of years ago. So when these findings were first reported, the uh, scientific community suggested that there has been some contamination and it's not really dino tissue. But the researchers who found this, they presented evidence that it really is dino tissue. And then the scientific community said, okay, so maybe then, you know, this, this kind of tissue can probably survive for millions of years when there is every indication otherwise that it cannot. Well, there is no surprise from the biblical point of view. Dinosaurs died in Noah's flood, which was just a few thousand years ago. So it's, it's not surprising that their tissue is still remaining. Uh, the fossilization of soft animals like jellyfish, again, is a testimony to sudden burial in a catastrophic event. If burial were to take place slowly, then soft parts of an animal would rot and they would be scavenged and they would not be fossilized. There are so many fossils that have been found with death rows. That is, their neck is arched back as if they are dying from asphyxiation. That is, water has entered them. They're not able to breathe. That is, again, exactly what one would expect in Noah's flood. Even birds would meet this kind of fate. Again, ephemeral markings are markings of raindrops or other soft, soft things that are not normally expected to be preserved. Again, this suggests sudden burial. There is an extreme paucity of human fossils and again, that is understandable in the light of Noah's flood. Uh, human beings would have constructed rafts when the flooding took place and they would have survived on the rafts for some time and then they would have died and they would have been floating on the water and so they wouldn't be fossilized. So it's not surprising that there are very few human fossils. There are certain animals that are found in the lower strata, supposedly Primitive animals, trilobites are an example. But the trilobite eye is one of the most sophisticated eyes that are there among all living things. So the question is, why does such a supposedly primitive animal have such sophisticated eyes? Now, this is some sort of misfit for evolution theory, but it fits very well with the creation and flood narrative. Uh, one of the aspects of fossils is the issue of transitional forms or missing links between different creatures or different organisms. There are some things that are worth clarifying about uh, transitional forms. Uh, if I have a small car and I also have a big car and then I have a medium sized car. And this is not proof that the medium sized car is the transitional form between the the small one and the big one. It could be a later model. It's just that different models were released at different times, having 
different sizes. So gradation does not prove anything. We have different animals of different sizes or they show some gradation and some property or some characteristic that they have. And what I want to point out here is that does not prove that these are successive stages of evolution. It is quite conceivable that the creator created animals of different sizes. There might have been some variations. Some of them might have been, some of them might have gone extinct. Another interesting property that we see in animals is the property of mosaics. That is, you have animals with a mix of different types of characteristics. A red panda has some characteristics of raccoons. It also has a ca some characteristics of bears. A duck-billed platypus is a mammal. That is, it breastfeeds its young, but it also lays eggs like reptiles. Now, this might make you think that perhaps the duck-billed platypus is a missing link between mammals and reptiles. No, it isn't. If there's a creator who's making mammals and reptiles, so he makes some creatures that don't breastfeed, that lay eggs, and then there are other creatures that breastfeed and give birth to live, uh, live offspring, it's quite conceivable that he made creatures with a mix of different features. If I was designing a product or if I was an artist making up different paintings, this is something that I have all the freedom to do. So what would a real transitional form look like? It would have to involve a mix of two different traits. Reptiles have scales, birds have feathers. The evolution theory states that reptiles evolved into birds. So we must see a, a, a structure which is like a half scale and a half feather because evolutionists believe, at least some of them believe, that feathers arose out of scales. Uh, if the creatures who used to give, um, who used to lay eggs, and now they give live birth, then we should be able to see some transition in this uh, birth process. The reptile lung is very different from the avian lung. So why don't we see a lung that is a mix of both? No creature has been ever found that has such a lung. And we should also see the genetic code for these mixed traits. Just imagine one computer program being changed to another computer program gradually. It's difficult to imagine how such a program would work, but that's what is needed uh, to believe in evolution theory. We, we would want to see half formed features. Uh, there are creatures that breastfeed their young and for humans we know that uh, the mother's milk is the best milk for the baby but if there are transitional forms they should be breastfeeding and they should have inferior milk because the, uh, the process of developing good milk has not yet been perfected. So these are the kinds of features that we should see in transitional forms but we don't see this among the few controversial examples that are tooted as missing links. The fourth evidence for evolution is change in organisms. We see organisms changing in front of us. Bacteria develop drug resistance. And so they seem to be fitter and stronger bacteria. So perhaps if this process continues, they become stronger and stronger and they might probably evolve into people. That's the logic. But when you look into the mechanism of how a drug resistance works, antibiotics latch on into receptors in the cell wall of the bacteria. So there is a definite structure for the receptor and the antibiotic has a matching structure and that's how it's able to latch on to the receptor and destroy the bacteria. So why is the antibiotic ineffective? because the receptor has lost its specificity. In other words, there has been a degradation in the bacteria. It's become less specific. It's become more general. And therefore, this is not the kind of change that is required to change uh, bacteria into people. What we need for bacteria to change to people is we need the addition of huge amounts of genetic information and that is not the change that is conferring the drug resistance. There have been some experiments conducted in which bacteria were not allowed to eat 
the food that they normally ate. And then they were, they were presented with other food. And lo and behold, after some time, the bacteria learned how to eat and digest the new food. So there's a change in the bacteria. They're able to adapt to their uh, surroundings, to new conditions. And perhaps if this process goes on, the bacteria are going to become people. Well, it's not that way when you take a closer look. So it turns out that bacteria already have a mechanism to digest citrate. But this mechanism is normally controlled by a genetic switch. And this switch is normally switched on only in anaerobic conditions, that is without oxygen. But now there is oxygen, so it's switched off. So some mutants appeared in which the switch was switched on. So evidently what happened is an already existing switch was switched on. That is the switch was perhaps destroyed and so it was always left on. And thus these mutant bacteria were able to digest the citrate. So again, it's a case of a loss of information. Something that could be flexible on or off was just left on. It's like if you have an electric light at home and you live in a place that's always dark, you may have some benefit in just leaving the switch on at all times. But that does not mean that your house has become more sophisticated. The crucial factor here is information content. There's been no increase in information content here. In some experiments, these mutants are found to appear very quickly, which means that the process of adaptation is not a random process. And that shows that it is a response to the environment based on some genetic capability that is already inherent in the organism. So similarly, we have speciation. Many people have heard of Darwin's finches. So you have uh, one bird ancestor that can give rise to many species of birds. This does not require millions of years. It just requires a few decades or centuries. Um, you have different kinds of animals adapting to different situations, like in a tropical region, bears would have less hair. In polar regions, bears would have more hair. But these are basically the shuffling of genetic information that already exists. It's not the creation of new genetic information. And therefore, this is not the kind of change that will turn bears into people. And as I said earlier, in many cases, these changes happen very quickly. Adaptation happens very quickly. Speciation happens very quickly. And this shows that it's a case of design. It's a case of engineering. There is already a facility inside the animal that's in the, in the genes, which allows it to adapt in response to the changing environment. So there was, uh, this is a quote from um, an experiment uh, conducted in, uh, by a Harvard team. So they, they, they say that that such events ever occurs seems almost unbelievable. The fact that these bacteria are able to adjust. It's like saying that, you know, how can this person win two or three lotteries in such quick succession? Well, the explanation is that the person has some control over the outcome in the lottery. And that's why he's able to win three lotteries in quick succession. So these, this quick adaptation shows that it is not a random process. It is not the random ablation that supposedly turned bacteria into people. Artificial breeding is the same thing with a little human input. Humans put pressure on animals and crossbreed them. So they again shuffle the genetic information, but this is not happening in a natural setting. It is happening in an artificial setting. So we have lots of changes in animals, but not the kind of change required them required for them to change to people. Another evidence that is cited for evolution is how different animals are distributed geographically and are able to adapt to their environment. So in polar regions, you have furry animals. In tropical regions, you have other types of animals. Now, the fact is, this is perfectly consistent with dispersal after the flood. According to the Bible, 
uh, animals would have migrated in different directions. Many of them would have died, but those that were able to adapt to their surroundings would survive. And this is, there is nothing in this that exclusively proves evolution. It is perfectly consistent with the biblical narrative. In fact, it's interesting to see that uh, we have animals that are separated by large distances and supposedly huge periods of time. For example, you have lions in Africa and jaguars in South America. According to evolutionary theory, these are cousins whose common ancestor lived about 3 million years ago. They are, and yet they are capable of mating with each other. The offspring though is not fertile. On the other hand, when jaguars and leopards mate, the offspring is fertile. And these are cousins who are supposedly meeting after 3 million years of evolutionary history. You have something similar with land and marine iguanas. They are able to mate. And these are iguanas that are supposedly separated by 10 million years of evolutionary history. Now, what's interesting is that for apes and humans, evolutionists claim that the last common ancestor was just about 6 million years ago. And yet humans and apes are not able to mate. How is it then that these animals, which are supposedly even more distant cousins, are able to mate? Well, evidently, what this suggests is that, is that these animals are not so distant cousins after all. According to the biblical, biblical narrative, these animals must have got separated a few thousand years ago. And so they have undergone minor variations. They are still able to mate. The next evidence is atavism, which is basically the appearance of a feature in a later animal or later organism that supposedly uh, belongs to an evolutionary ancestor. So you have human beings who are born with a tail. So that is supposedly proof that we evolved from apes that had tails. Now, this is a man from Cuba with six fingers. Nobody is suggesting that human beings evolved from a lower ancestor having six fingers. Uh, this person, Yu Zhenhuan, uh, has hair growing all over his body. So an evolutionist would probably say that, yeah, that's evidence that, you know, we have evolved from apes, hairy apes, but then we don't have any apes that have hair growing in their gums. So this, this shows that this atavism is just a genetic defect. There's something going wrong in our genes, and that's why the body appears different from how it is supposed to be. It's not a throwback or a flashback to some supposed evolutionary history. It's just a genetic mistake that is causing a mistake in the body of the organism. Then we have the case of vestigial organs. These are organs that have supposedly lost their function because they were suitable for the evolutionary ancestor and not for the current organism. So the human body supposedly has many vestigial organs and uh, there seems to be some disclaimer on the part of evolutionists now. They, they say that some of these structures may still have some function. So they're trying to accommodate the possibility that's learned the hard way that sometimes you assume that something doesn't have any function, but it turns out that it has function. So they say the primary function has been lost, but now there is a function. But to use such terms uh, shows that you're assuming that evolution has taken place. That's why you refer to the function in the lower organism as a primary function. Now, let's look at vestigial organs more closely. Uh, there are some cases in which there is an obvious loss of function. Like you have fishes with eyes, but the eyes are not functioning properly. So they're blind. All members of the species are blind. We have birds that have wings, but cannot fly. So these birds must have evolved from other birds which have, which had wings or which were able to fly. Well, but this is also what one would expect from the fall. The Bible says that the earth has been cursed. So it is natural to expect that there would be some deterioration in creatures. In fact, there's one very interesting case of a vestigial organ. 
and that is the hind limb bud of pythons and boa constrictors. So these big snakes apparently had legs in the past or their ancestors had legs, but now they don't. And if you have read Genesis 3, uh, then that is highly suggestive. Uh, there, uh, the language used there suggests that serpents or at least some serpents had limbs, but then they would lose their limbs. So these kind of vestigial organs are perfectly fitting within the biblical narrative. And so they do not constitute exclusive evidence for evolution. There are other cases in which there is no obvious function or it's not an obvious loss of function. You have the appendix in humans and it's not so obvious as to why this appendix is there. Uh, Darwin confused it with another organ in cattle that was used to digest uh, grass, but human beings don't eat grass. So he thought that it's a vestigial organ, but now it is understood that the appendix has some function. It seems to have something to do with the immune system. And when we have a stomach infection, uh, the good bacteria in our gut gets uh, overtaken by the bad bacteria. And then we, it is all flushed out of our system. We have loose motions and it all goes away. And then the appendix is apparently used as a repository of the good bacteria. So it stores the good bacteria while all the bad bacteria has been sent out and then that is replenished. So an organ that seemed to be vestigial is not really vestigial. So this does not constitute evidence for evolution. Then we have the case of bad design, supposedly bad design. So the eye has drawn the, uh, the, the criticism of some evolutionists saying that, you know, the human eye is badly designed. And if it was made by an almighty creator, then it wouldn't have been designed in this way. So what's so bad about the human eye? There are these rod and cone cells that detect light. Okay, this is an expanded uh, part, expanded view of this small part. So these are the uh, detectors of light. And the light comes from the left side, but then you have some wiring that is blocking them. So that would at least partially obstruct the light. Wouldn't it be better to have this wiring behind so that all the light comes clearly? Now, this seems to be a case of bad design. Now, when we hear claims like this, we must note a couple of points. It's very easy to be an armchair critic. If you've designed anything or if you've attempted to change a design, you know that if you try to change something, then something else tends to go wrong. And so it's very difficult to fit everything properly together. So there may be a reason for a certain design feature that is not apparent. It will only become apparent to you when you try to construct it on your own and nobody has been able to construct a human eye. It turns out that at least some of this wiring is needed because we need to have blood cells to maintain the rods and the cones from this side. But later on, scientists found that there was something even more involved here. There are also these Mueller cells that seem to, uh, make a, that seem to give a provision to overcome the obstruction that is caused by this front wiring. These Mueller cells capture light, they behave like optic fibers and they enhance sharpness. They keep out invisible radiation. So it turns out that what was supposedly thought of as a bad design feature was accompanied by something to more than compensate it. And so the eye turns out that it's very well designed. We'll close with a few remarks on human evolution. Uh, we must note that when you look at the history, uh, it's not the discovery of ape men that led people to believe in evolution. They already became convinced about evolution and then they started looking for ape men. There, is, there are only a few fragmentary remains, uh, small pieces of skull and bone from which this, the story of human evolution is supposedly reconstructed. So we are not going to go into the, all, all of the details, but this is an example of a fragmentary remain. 
Um, it's small fragments like this that are supposedly proof that we evolved from apes. So one researcher writes like this, the origin of our own genus remains frustratingly unclear. If you look up the evolution of man, you have different trees. Note some of the uh, so-called missing links coming up here. There is Homo habilis, there is Homo uh, erectus, there is Africanus here. And you have many of these trees. But if you look at these trees carefully, you notice that what is a main link in the chain leading to humans in one case seems to be a side link in the other other diagram. So you have different diagrams not agreeing with each other. Like in the first diagram, Africanus was on a side on a side branch, but now here Africanus is on the way to Homo sapiens. So you have lots of inconsistencies between different uh, ancestral trees. Another interesting feature that we see here is that there are no missing links between the chimpanzee and the last common ancestor. Now, why is that? There's a saying that you should follow the money. You should follow the glamour. You should follow what makes a sensation. If you're a researcher and you claim to have found uh, a missing link for chimpanzees, I mean, you won't get much attention. But if you claim that you have found a missing link for the origin of humans, uh, that is interesting media stuff. And so you have so many missing links or ancestors of humans hardly any for uh, chimpanzees. So you see lots of inconsistencies. And um, another thing to notice is that these are pictures drawn by artists. They do not follow rigorously from the bone fragments that are used to create them. Now this was the cover of Discovery Magazine when one of these uh, skulls was discovered. It says a revolution in the story of evolution. So two bones or a few fragments found in Africa can completely rewrite the story of evolution. That forces us to question, what was the story made of in the first place? Here is an article from Time. And it says, scholars of human evolution often don't have much to go on. It's rare that prehistoric bones are preserved as fossils and much rarer still that paleoanthropologists find anything approaching the complete skull of any individual. Yeah, so that's what our story is written on. And it doesn't matter how the details keep changing. Uh, this news item itself says that there was a rare find that uh, has surprising implications throughout the fossil record. In other words, the whole story of evolution is going to change because of this one find. So it, it doesn't matter what the story is, as long as that there is an overall narrative that human beings have evolved from lower animals. What I want to point out here is the lack of rigor. And you don't need to be uh, a person in the subject to know or to perceive that there is a good amount of speculation here. These are not rigorous scientific facts. So we close our review of evolution with this. We have looked at different evidences for evolution. And we have seen that these evidences are also consistent with the biblical record. We also see that uh, a lot of speculation uh, goes into the building up of the theory of evolution. It's not based on hard facts. And therefore, it's not a logical choice for a person who would like to base his beliefs on evidence and facts. Thank you very much.